Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's learning session, read at UNFCCC COP19, Outcomes and Next Steps, where we'll be talking about the Warsaw Red Framework. This pre presentation is uh, organized by World Wildlife Fund's Forest and Climate Program. My name is Breen Burns, and I'm a Program Officer for Learning and Communications. And our presenters today are Josefina Branya Varela, Policy Director of WWF's Forest and Climate Program, Hermina Kleiman, Program Officer for Red Policy at WWF Germany, and John O. Niles, Director for Climate and Forests with WWF US. So before we begin, I'd like to share a few housekeeping tips and reminders. Today's presentation is being recorded, and you can access the recording within a few days on our YouTube channel. To find the recording, simply go to youtube.com and search for WWF forest and climate, or go to panda.org slash forest climate and look for the red learning section. There are two audio options. You can listen via your computer speakers or dial in through the number that was provided in your registration email. It's important to note that if you experience audio difficulties while listening via your computer, this can sometimes be caused by having multiple software applications or too many internet windows open. So feel free to close some of them, and that usually solves the problem, or you're also welcome to join via phone. If you're having any technical troubles during the session, please send me a message via the chat area if possible, and I will try to help. Questions are absolutely welcome. Please submit your questions for our presenters through the toolbar on your screen on the right-hand side, and we will answer as many as possible during our allotted time. For anything that we don't get to cover, you're invited to post them to our online RED learning platform, redcommunity.org. After the webinar, you'll receive a link in your email to the place on the website where you can post your questions, so you'll see that when the session is concluded. So thank you again for joining us, and with that, we'll get started, and I will turn it over to Josefina for a brief introduction for us. Thank you, uh, Bryn, and good morning, everybody uh, from Washington, D.C. Um, so thanks for joining, and uh, we just want to share with you our, um, our analysis from the outcomes uh, for RED at the UNFCCC COP19. Um, in general terms, the COP um, happened in an environment of a lot of stress and frustration because uh, not, uh, there were not a lot of um, um, clear uh, advances and, and, and not a lot of political will, uh, will to move forward with, um, with the negotiations in different topics. However, for RED, uh, this was a very important COP and it was a very successful COP. Um, in the aftermath, uh, you will hear different analysis, and, and that's what we want to, to share with you, our perspective of, of, the, of the decisions uh, made and, and uh, of course, the adoption of the Warsaw Framework for RED. Um, so for us, uh, what, how we have structured the presentation today is that we are going to talk about the technical progress uh, made uh, under SOFSTA, and that's going to be uh, for Jono to discuss. Then we're going to talk about the institutional arrangements and coordination of support, uh, which is the joint SOFSTA SBI process. And Hermina is going to uh, walk us uh, through the progress on that track. And then I'm going to talk about the results-based finance for RED Plus, um, which was uh, handled in the COP work program. And finally, I will just share with you some of our conclusions and, and our analysis. Um, and as Green said, we, we welcome any questions you may have. Um, so this slide is only for your reference. We always do this in our webinars. This is our uh, WWF vision for RED. I'm not going to go over it today. Um, so better just start with the, uh, with the substance of the presentation. And uh, as I was telling you, um, the environment in, in, in Warsaw was uh, not the most positive one. Um, people were very stressed out with uh, broader issues. Uh, such as the ADP and discussions that are very, very relevant, like loss and damage. In the context of the typhoon in the Philippines, this, it, this issue got a lot of attention and this sense of urgency. However, it was not really translated to, to the pace of the negotiations. The pace of the negotiations were very slow, um, and, and there was not uh, a lot of uh, compromise uh, shown by parties. However, for RED, uh, it was um, a very uh, important COP. The two weeks were very, very busy. Uh, as you know, we have these three tracks uh, for the negotiations on RED. 
the first one is soft star um, with uh, five, uh, well, actually seven uh, items in the agenda. Five of them uh, were going to be adopted or discussed in Warsaw. Three of them were resolved in, in June, and two of them were going to be the, the main point in, uh, of discussion in Warsaw. So we will go over the details. But just for you to know, um, the COP adopted five decisions here. Then uh, in the negotiation tract of Sobsta SBI, um, the discussions were going to be around the coordination of support for implementation of red activities, as well as the consideration of uh, institutional, and, uh, institutional arrangements and governance alternatives. Um, this track uh, was, uh, the discussions were very heated in this track, and, and Hermina will, will tell you more about it, but one decision was adopted coming out of this track, and this joint process uh, actually uh, is closed now. And finally, in the COP work program, well, there were a lot of, um, uh, I don't know, expectations around uh, the finance decision and what parties uh, could be able to agree on this track uh, without, to be, without being inconsistent with the rest of the broader uh, discussions on climate change architecture for finance. Um, so we, like parties, managed to adopt one decision and, and decided to keep discussing more uh, about the ways and means to transfer payments uh, in the standing committee of the finance uh, corporate program. So um, discussions are going to uh, to keep going on. Uh, what is important for me to say in this overview is that the, the, the parties went into the negotiations under the understanding and they were very clear that the red decisions are go were going to be a package. There was no way that only technical progress was going to be made and decisions on the technical side were going to be adopted if there was no de uh, decision and clear uh, progress made in the finance part uh, of the discussions, specifically in the COP work program. So all parties uh, established this as a commitment at the beginning of the negotiation saying, we are here to seek compromises and to work together, but this has to be a package and it's going to be a fair package, a balanced package in which we have the technical decisions, but we also have uh, a, a strong finance decision that uh, creates certainty that there's going to be support in the medium and long term. So that's how negotiations started, and now uh, we're going to go uh, very quickly uh, towards uh, just our points. How, how WWF went to the COP? what were our expectations in, in, in regards to, to RED. So what we wanted to see is a commitment to, to build a RED mechanism that will benefit people and nature. Um, and in specific, we, we really were expecting to, to see parties reaching an agreement on technical assessment of reference levels and the agreement on the guidelines for uh, MRV for RED, um, as well as the progress on the soft space finance architecture elements. Uh, to ensure support of, of all phases. So we, we knew that it was impossible for us to expect commitments or numbers in terms of money uh, in the table, but we, we wanted to see some, some of the architecture elements for, for the Red Plus finance mechanism. And then finally, another uh, of our expectations that uh, it was very important for us, it was to, to have the certainty uh, or a clear pathway to integrate Red into the broader climate architecture. So now we are going to go to, to the outcomes and results, and, and then at the end I will, I will try to link our expectations with the conclusions. So, um, Jono, it's all yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see some friendly faces out there, and uh, thanks, Josefina. Um, I'm just going to spend about 10 minutes talking about um, the, the technical work that was done in Warsaw. Um, obviously, um, if you read the papers or any of the results afterwards, it's a, it was a very exciting um, set of decisions. It really does provide um, sort of a complete um, instruction manual for parties that want to seek results-based finance. Um, so there were, going into Warsaw, there were three decisions that are fairly short decisions um, that had already been adopted at the previous sub-step um, in June, and you'll see those on the screen. Um, fairly, you know, not not really nuanced or um, exciting decisions about drivers, safeguards, um, and national forest monitoring systems. So what was really <clears throat> in play in Warsaw was whether or not the parties could agree on reference levels, and uh, more specifically, how the reference levels that are submitted by parties will be assessed. 
Um, and then the mother of all issues um, around verification of RAD was kind of um, embedded in the, in the um, negotiations on uh, measurement reporting and verification. And they're still ahead on non-carbon benefits and non-market um, approaches. And so those will be issues that continue after, um, well, into the new year. So we can go to the next slide, please, Bree. Um, so in short, um, the parties were able to reach consensus on both of the two major decisions that were in front of them. Um, and I'm just going to walk you through some of the key elements of, of both of these. Uh, you're probably aware of the fact that um, from Durban uh, two years ago, countries had already decided on what should go into a reference level and how they should be packaged. They should be um, you know, expressed in tons of CO2 equivalent per year. They should be based on historical data but could be adjusted. Um, they're supposed to use the um, IPCC good practice guidance and guidelines um, as their core architecture. Um, so these were already sort of uh, messages delivered to the countries. And what needed to happen now was if a party submits a reference level, um, which has not happened yet, um, what, what does that mean? What will happen to it? Um, so they were able to make this decision, and what they really said was, um, first of all, when a, part, when a country submits a reference level, the, the, the overarching obvious steps are that there will be a technical assessment about whether the parties met the guidelines that had been established um, primarily in Durban. Um, so that's sort of a no-brainer, but there's a fair amount of language that kind of repeats those guidelines um, from previous decisions. Um, the other thing that the technical assessment um, decision did was it really asked the Secretariat to prepare a synthesis report on the reference level assessment process. And although this may seem like a slightly technical thing, it's probably pretty important because um, if we look towards after 2015 um, and movement towards a new treaty, um, these reports could really become um, very important numerical um, indicators for countries. So. Um, just like the, the Kyoto Protocol had an annex with numerical commitments by country, um, we could see these reports becoming some sort of numerical placeholder for the red emissions in red countries. Um, so pretty important. Um, um, then there's a lot of, this was like a, I think a four-page decision, then there's a whole bunch of detail, very, very prescriptive um, ways that the rep best um, for the Secretariat um, the authority and sort of the mandate to do this, provided they have finances. But the objectives and the scopes, there were some um, differences of opinion going into the negotiations around wording. Um, and Josefina can, or Hermina can, can also comment on this, but it, in essence it basically says that the, the objectives and the scope of the assessment is whether a party submitting a reference level has met the previous decisions. So it's a long, long-winded way of saying, um, did they do the job that they were asked to do? Um, then there's um, fairly detailed information, um, decision information about the procedures. Um, the reference level assessment process will be organized by the Secretariat. Um, it will have experts who are not from the party being evaluated, uh, pulled from the land use and land use chain expert panel that the Secretariat keeps. Um, and then there's um, the opportunity for the consultative group on experts from, I forget the full name here, um, but there's another um, entry for experts to also be involved in the uh, assessment. Um, there's a very detailed timing, very prescriptive. It sort of talks about when a country submits an, a reference level and when the um, assessment team has to be built or notified, and then there's some back and forths. Um, so that's uh, quite a bit of the, the, the decision that was made. And a lot of this is pulled from the previous reference level assessment process on uh, Annex 1 countries. Um, so this was kind of a template that they had to work from. Um, and then, of course, very importantly, the assessment teams will submit their report, um, and it may have comments by parties, um, the party being assessed through some of this back and forth, but they will submit this report um, to the Red Web platform and make it publicly available. Um, and then presumably, and you'll hear about this a little bit later with Hermina and Josefina talking about institutions and finance, presumably once they do this, someone's going to pay them to try and get below a reference level. Um, so that's, um, that's why the reference levels are important. 
looking at the second major decision, um, the second major technical decision on MRV, um, one of the most contentious issues throughout the red negotiations and um, the triple C negotiations at large, uh, obviously revolve around verification. Um, so it is probably worth noting, just sort of before I jump into the second major decision, that really RED is paving the way on the technical guidance, very detailed guidance, very pres um, prescriptive process for evaluating new information about parties' um, emissions from the um, non-Annex 1 parties, that's the reference level assessment process. And now we have some really um, progressive language on how RED emission reductions could get verified. So it's it's, it's people on this phone are probably red aficionados anyway, um, but it is clear that red is continuing to sort of be better. Um, and when we look at the reference, uh, excuse me, when we look at the verification decision, we again see that they want the measurement reporting and verification. So this is once a country submits a reference level, and once they actually do work, presumably to reduce emissions or increase stocks they're going to want to get paid for that. And to do that, they're going to need to get those emission reductions or that added sequestration verified. Um, so what was very elegant about this decision, and it's something that Peter Graham, who was the chair, really did a great job um, bringing a whole bunch of issues together. He said, well, if we're going to do the verification, and the parties, of course, agreed to this, then it, all the, the way that a country submits its information has to be consistent with all the previous decisions on um, MRV that have been out there. Um, on reference levels, so there's a real explicit link that the reference level is the starting point, and then the verification will be the difference between the country's emissions and that reference level. That had always been assumed, but now it's kind of locked and loaded. Um, and it also provided um, a lot of important sort of uh, outreach to the NAMA issue, which is nationally appropriate mitigation actions, but it sort of firmly said that we want this MRV process to be associated with some of that NAMA process. Um, we also knew going in that it was biennial updates. Um, so non-Annex 1 countries will be submitting these biennial updates. And the elegance of the verification and the reporting is that um, for RED, they can sort of add a technical annex. And this was allowed um, through the prior decisions that talk about the biennial updates and the um, the ICA process, which is the International uh, Consultations and Analysis. Um, so basically it sets up a framework where countries will submit their emissions through their biennial updates and the technical annex. And they have to be, as I already said, they have to sort of express everything in a consistent way so that the international community can say, here's what we assessed your reference levels at earlier, and here's what your new levels are, therefore we know what the difference is. Um, and again, then there was a fair amount of um, uh, language that was agreed to that the, the process for reviewing and verifying this will be through the ICA process, this um, pre-existing structure um, that is how non-annex one parties have their information evaluated. Um, so then there's a whole bunch of linkages to that process. Um, and I think I'll leave it there and we'll pick up questions at the end. Oh yeah, I guess we do have a couple quick, quick concluding thoughts. Sorry about that. Um, we already noted that there were these three shorter decisions. So drivers, national force monitoring systems, and safeguards were adopted. And so those are still important. I don't mean to suggest that they're not important. It's more that they had already been there. Um, and they do provide a little bit of additional guidance for how the technical information um, through the reference levels and the verification and uh, measurement and reporting will need to happen. Um, we also see that in essence, the, the, the Warsaw Red framework um, has basically all the guidance that countries need to seek this results-based finance. They had had most of it before, but they didn't know how they would be assessed or verified, their reference levels assessed, or any emission reductions verified. So now they can see that there really is a process for that. Um, of course, we haven't seen a single reference level submitted. We haven't seen uh, many of the red elements that have been called for um, submitted. Even I don't think there's been a national red plan submitted um, or safeguard information system or any information that's been called for. So 
that's also a really clear <clears throat> indication that the demands on red countries are really substantial. Um, doing the carbon accounting and, um, and some of the other associated work is just really tough. Um, so donors are going to have to continue to provide a lot more support, um, financial and technical. Um, and then, of course, what's really important is not the technical parts, but what happens to the technical stuff. So there are some linkages built into the agreements that you're going to hear a little bit more from Hermina right now and later on Josefina. Hermina, over to you. Thanks, John Ol. Hi, everybody. My name is Hermine. Um, I'm working with WWF Germany on red policy as well. And I have spent the first week in Warsaw together with Josefina and the, the all awesome team. Um, so I quickly guide you through the, the decision um, by the joint Substan SBI process on the institutional arrangement and coordination for red. First of all, the mandate, just quickly to um, to remind you um, what's um, set by the COP18 to the joint substar and SBI process to um, set up a process with the aim of um, to identify the need to improve the coordination of support for the implementation of activities, of all red activities, all phases, to provide adequate and predictable support and to consider existing institutional arrangement or potential governance alternatives. Well, as you, um, I, I suppose most of you know that this process was quite difficult actually and has been dragged on since COP18 and even though Substar 38 was uh, mandated to come up with the process, this process has been stalled in Bonn during, um, due to the agenda fight going on back in June. Uh, however, there was an in-session workshop held in Boone in, in, in Bonn in June 2013. Um, in Warsaw, there was nearly no decision on red and only at last minute um, this, this fight could actually, um, could actually be addressed uh, on HOD level. So there was a big, there was a big fight going on between um, the Coalition for Rainforest Nation, who was actually pushing for a red committee, and other parties uh, who, who do not want to have a red committee, at least not at this stage, or wanted to rather, rather um, address or uh, reflect on existing institutions to take over coordination for red finance. Um, however, in the very, very last end, um, an HOD level, this issue could be resolved, so we could finally have the full red package existing out of the technical and the financial components. Um, as you might have realized, there is a lot of overlap between the work of the joint SBI and Substar process and the COP work program on finance. Josefina will go deeper into what has been decided under the work program regarding coordination for results-based finance. The difference is here that the joint SBI and Substar work um, was addressing all phases of RED, while the COP work program was only, is only addressing results-based finance phase three for RED. Um, and the work program for, uh, under the COP actually complements the SBI and Substar program. So Josefina will actually add on to what I will explain and guide you through. The background for, um, the background for, for this need and for this mandate was that there was an overall agreement amongst the party that existing finance avenues need to improve coordination at all levels meaning donor level, national level, organizational level, to ensure the effectiveness and best possible use of available resources. That means a streamlining of all finances going on and flowing into red activities at all levels. Um, so some parties wanted to, as I briefly explained earlier, some parties wanted to come up with a centralized approach to channel funds and uh, other parties wanted to just have a choice of multiple channels of financing still continuing. Um, there was diff different options on the table. Uh, one option was using existing systems and to enhance coordination like using the Red Plus Partnership. Another option was making use of the UNFCCC process and the Substar processes. The third option was a new body or committee to create and the fourth option was um, uh, getting the GCF, the Green Climate Fund, to channel red. So in order to just briefly say um, the, the big outcome from this decision was actually that no red committee 
will be created at this stage. This decision is postponed to latest 2017 and the improvement of coordination uh, will, will likely take place through annual meetings um, with national focal points and also finance institute, institutions. Next slide, please. Um, so, as I, this is a little bit of a more detailed uh, overview of the outcomes. Um, so, as you see, the countries are now asked to assign national coordination entities or national focal points who will serve as a liaison, liaison point to the UNFCCCC, which may obtain results-based finance and which also should address the following needs and functions. So, these are actually all the questions which has, has have been raised previously in meetings and workshops. So how to strengthen information sharing good practices, how to identify and consider possible needs and gaps, um, to provide opportunities to exchange information between bodies under the convention and bilateral multilateral, multilateral finance entities, and how to um, inform on improving effectiveness of finance. So. Um, these national focal points are encouraged, it's a very soft language, to voluntarily meet annually to discuss the above matters, which should start uh, next year in December in Lima and in Substar 41. And what I forgot to mention here is that uh, all finance institutions which provide um, red finance at the moment to join these discussions in order to, to streamline processes and address the above mentioned issues. Um, the SBI is, uh, is asked to consider the outcomes of these discussions um, on existing institutional arrangements or the need for potential governance alternatives and make recommendations at COP23 in December or latest by 2017. So what, uh, there is a big, of course we all need, <laughs> we all know that there is a big, um, there is a big issue which had not been addressed and which is, which is actually due, due to the fact that RED is dependent on the overall finance commitments by countries to the Green Climate Fund, to the overall process and as you are aware there is no agreement on the provision of adequate and predictable support so this mandate has not been addressed appropriately. Next slide please. So just for concluding thoughts. Um, as, uh, as you are aware, or for those who have read the decisions, there is a very soft language. It, is, it always says encouraging countries, voluntary basis, um, so it's very discretionary. Um, also, RED must have a place in ADP Workstream 1 and 2 to ensure the predictability of finance. That's what I said. RED is actually part of the overall process and is not, is not a separate process by itself. And in the future we need to ensure that this is actually taken up under the work streams as well as also appropriately addressed by discussions on the, the new market-based market mechanisms and the ADP. Um, for me what was also not very clear in the future is the role of the Red Plus partnership and also the, the more or less the legal nature of the annual meetings. Will this be UNFCCC um, workshops? Will this be uh, working groups under UNFCCC? Is this like I don't know, it's some, some meetings, some loose meetings outside the UNFCCC, what is the role of the Red Plus Partnership? And um, also, once the GCF is operationalized in 2014, how, what is actually the role of the various finance channels of bilateral, of uh, multilateral money? Is this going to be channeled through the fund or not? So I'm going to put this here and end my presentation and ask Josefina to continue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hermina. Um, so we're going to go now to the third track of negotiation, which was the COPOR program on Red uh, Plus um, Results-Based Finance. Um, so just to give you a refresher on, on what was the mandate uh, when parties created this COPOR program. So the aim of the COPOR program was to contribute to the ongoing efforts to scale up and improve the effectiveness of finance for the activities, uh, for the Red activities. And uh, they were expecting that this would address options to achieve this objective, including ways and means to transfer payments for resource-based actions, ways to incentivize non-carbon benefits, and ways to improve coordination of resource-based finance. That, that is the mandate from the Doha decision one year ago. And uh, of course, our expectations were uh, that we would see the elements of resource-based resource architecture for red, 
the, to have the reassurance that the red plus finance will move beyond the existing fast start period uh, to include both the mid and long term and to clarify a roadmap and the course of the discussions on red plus resource based finance. Um, next please. So now what I'm going to do is uh, I am going to give you some of the main highlights uh, of the decision uh, that parties agreed and, and that the court adopted. So first of all, the decision um, the decision so far is like four pages more or less, and it uh, makes reference continuously to uh, the need for adequate and predictable financial and technology support for all red uh, plus requirements, meaning the reference level, the MRD, the safeguard information system, and uh, national forest monitoring systems and, and uh, national strategies. Um, so there are there are um, several uh, mentions of this uh, with soft language, like or with reiterative language, uh, recalling decisions, reaffirming. Uh, however, it doesn't say how uh, we are going to guarantee that there is predictable and financial and technology support. Um, so, and, and also it doesn't state who should provide such support. So there is not a single mention that developed countries will provide this support. Um, but however, uh, if we see further in the decision, there is a recognition that the Green Climate Fund will play a key role in channeling financial resources to developing countries. Um, so I believe this is a very good point. Uh, in the first draft, uh, the draft of the decision shared with parties in the, in the first meeting that they, they had in Warsaw, there was not a single mention of the Green Climate Fund in the whole decision, which was very disappointing. So we're happy to see that now that the final decision recognizes the key role of, of the GCF. Um, also, the decision reaffirms the need for adequate and predictable support for all phases of RED, which is also uh, a very important point, uh, especially was uh, very important for the least developed countries to have this reassurance that uh, the resources are going to be there, uh, the support is going to be there uh, for all phases because, uh, as you know, many countries are in different stages of readiness or uh, different uh, phases of RED. So not, not a, every country starts from the same uh, starting point. So it is important to recognize that the support should be there and it's needed in all phases. Um, then the decision establishes uh, also the link. Uh, this is a very important uh, point and, and a victory for, for many. Um, it establishes the link between access to finance and the respect of safeguards. So this was very a, a very controversial issue uh, back in June when SOFSTA uh, forwarded this decision on, on safeguards uh, to be adopted by COP19 uh, in this session because the decision on safeguards was uh, too uh, soft in the, in the sense of the time and frequency where parties or red countries should, should provide information on how are they addressing and respecting safeguards. Uh, so the, the way to make it stronger and to guarantee that actually the safeguards are going to be in place, uh, it was making the link in the, in the finance decision. So this is what happened. So now the decision establishes that uh, for a red country um, to access results-based payments, first it has to submit the, more, uh, the most uh, updated uh, report on the, information, uh, on the information on how safeguards are addressed and respected. So this is a very important point to um, to guarantee that the uh, red implementation it is uh, in complete alignment with the requirements of the decision. Uh, next, please. Okay. So the decision also encourages all financial uh, financing entities, including the GCF, to channel support in fair and balanced manner. And this is also a very important point that parties, uh, especially developing parties, were asking uh, for a. To, to see in a finance decision. And the reason is uh, many countries are claiming that there are very few countries that are actually receiving any, any sources of funds and, and support. Um, mainly the big countries uh, in the red world are like Indonesia, Brazil, uh, DRC, uh, Guyana, the, the ones that have like the big bilateral deals. And there are many, many countries that are not receiving any support at all. So for many countries, especially for least developing countries, again, um, it was very important to have this mention that the, this global mechanism for RED under the convention uh, should channel support in a fair and balanced manner. So that's, that's um, stated in the, in the decision. Um, 
The decision also links the methodological package or, or the rule book uh, that Jono was telling us about uh, two of the, uh, of the key pieces of this package. Um, it's, it's, uh, it links a methodological package to the, to the support. Uh, in particular, it requests the GCF to apply the methodological guidance when providing results-based finance. So the language is soft for other entities, uh, but in general terms, it encourages other entities uh, that are out there financing red activities to apply the same guidance. And this is in terms of consistency and to reduce transaction costs for red countries, to have clarity on the rules for everybody, and um, to stop this, uh, this very costly process in which a red country will apply to certain funds and will have to um, uh, meet some requirements and then go to other funder and meet other requirements. So now that we have the methodological package approved, um, the, uh, the aim is that everybody will uh, apply the same rules so it, it would be clearer and easier for a red country to access funds. So also uh, a very important decision uh, that was made by parties is that they have established an information hub on the UNFCCC web platform um, for RED to publish all the information on results and the corresponding payments. This, uh, this point was uh, very, uh, very much discussed throughout the year in all the meetings and uh, there was discussions about creating a registry or a repository or a tracking log or, or some, some sort of tool that would allow us to see what is out there to be supported and what is already receiving support and, and that you can see the, what are the results. And, and this has many purposes. Uh, first, of trans transparency. Uh, second, to, to be able to identify the gaps and where, where the support is needed the most, but also what, what is happening with the support, the financial support? Where is it uh, being delivered and how much, etc. So it is a little bit of a um, platform to be transparent about what is happening in the red world uh, in terms of results achieved but also in terms of support delivered. So uh, the name is Information Hub um, and, and it's going to be more, um, I guess, uh, developed in the next uh, year. Uh, the Secretariat has to adapt the web platform to, to make it uh, feasible for uh, the results to be, to be uploaded there. So we will have to wait and see the developments of this tool in the next, in the next few months. Um, also, the decision uh, delineates a pathway or checklist to unlock results-based finance. And this is no, no new requirements at all. Uh, the only thing that the decision makes in paragraph 11 is that clarifies and, and describes what is the pathway to unlock results-based finance for a, a red country. And this is very useful because when, when, when you go and read the decisions, the decisions always make reference to other decisions that make reference to other decisions, and it is very confusing. So it was important in this finance decision to actually describe what is the process to actually unlock finance. And uh, no new requirements are there except probably from uh, the, the reference to upload the national strategy or action plan into the web platform. So before in decision 1 CP 16, there was only the mention that a country has to have a national red strategy or action plan, but what to do with it or where to put it or if it should be shared or not, it was not clear. So now with the paragraph 11, uh, you know that you have to upload your, your national strategy to the, to the information hub. So I believe that this is going to be very good to add clarity to red countries in the process of, of implementation and in the, in the pathway towards uh, accessing resource-based finance. And finally, another very important point of the decision is what we've been discussing, uh, this need of linking more the discussions around RED uh, to the broader climate change architecture and other discussions under the convention. So parties decided that uh, they, they request the Standing Committee on Finance to dedicate its soon as possible forum to consider the issue of financing for forests. And in particular, the issue of ways and means to transfer payments for results-based actions, <coughs> sorry, that was not resolved in this decision and that could not be resolved because we have to be consistent with the broader decisions on finance under the convention. And because the, the broader picture is still not there or is still not um, ready to have these discussions at, the, at this level of detail, uh, 
we, I mean, I guess uh, what we would expect is that all the decisions are consistent to those decisions. So the way to do it was to link it to, to the broader discussions. Um, so it's not only the ways and means for, to transfer payments for resource-based actions, but also uh, how to uh, transfer payments or, or resources for alternative approaches, such as the joint mitigation and adaptation mechanism. Um, so those, those were the main highlights of the decision. The decision is uh, quite substantial, uh, four pages. Uh, I, I guess um, what we have to recognize as the, is that the decision uh, doesn't fully resolve the COP work program mandate of contributing to scale-up finance for REF. Um, and there's a lot of, of things still to be done. But we have to recognize that the decision explicitly establishes a link between the GCF and REF, which is a, a big step forward. It creates and clarifies a, and clarifies a pathway to access results based finance. Um, and this is linked completely to the methodological package. So this creates certainty for countries uh, moving forward implementation that they have the, the rules clear of what they have to do and if they follow these rules and apply the guidance then they, they will have um, access to resource-based finance uh, through the GCF but also through other sources of funds. Uh, the decision is, is quite uh, flexible, it keeps the options open for different so sources of support, still it considers public, pri private, market-based, non-market-based, etc. Um, so this decision, um, what it does, it sets the ball rolling for red countries to move towards implementation in the different phases. And it represents a very important building block for connecting red to the broader archi uh, climate architecture. Um, and finally, I, I guess the, the political will and ambition and commitment will be key in the months to come to achieve a stronger decision that ensures finance for red in the medium and long term. And this is in the road. Uh, to Paris, but also um, having uh, more substantive discussions in, in Lima and see how we can push for meaningful discussions in the, in the standing committee uh, regarding RED and how um, parties will be um, effective enough to keep the relevance of RED in the discussions when, when now the discussions are going to be paired with other broader discussions that are not really moving forward. So in conclusion, um, when the Warsaw Framework for RED has been adopted, uh, it's composed by seven, seven decisions. Um, and by concluding at least most of the Cancun mandate, uh, parties have made RED a reality. I mean, the, the set of decisions probably, they are not perfect. There, there are things that could be better. Uh, we need a stronger language uh, and a stronger, a stronger decisions. But one thing that nobody can deny is that now RED is a reality. I mean, it's out there, the, the methodological package and, and, and the requirements are there, and the link to the GCF is there. So now we have to just keep moving to push uh, for scaling up finance. So yeah, the rules are clearly defined now. Um, the methodological guidance and technical decisions promote transparency and environmental integrity. I believe that, uh, as Jonah was, was saying, uh, it is very refreshing to see uh, technical decisions that are really uh, promoting more more transparency. Um, parties have shown that uh, with hard work and political will, consensus can be achieved. So RED could actually be taken as an example of uh, how things uh, and, and good outcomes can be achieved under the convention. So other other groups should be looking at uh, at RED as an example and, and analyze why why the RED group is moving and, and the rest are not. Um, and finally, yeah, RED is now linked to other relevant discussions under the UNFCCC and it, it is uh, implied that uh, RED has an important contribution to the climate change discussion and actions. So this is my last slide and I just wanted to, to put out there what is next and, and some of the, uh, the things that are still to be discussed. Um, for, for next year, the, the ways and means to transfer results-based payments uh, is going to be a very important discussion, um, and as well as the operationalization of the information hub, because it is described there, but we will have to wait and see how is, it is uh, it's going to be designed and, and how it's going to be actually put in place. Um, there are a couple of issues pending in SOFSTA, which are the methodological aspects for non-carbon benefits and non-market-based approaches. and uh, 
Another important discussion to take into consideration is uh, these reflections on a post-2020 agreement and the role of forests in a land-based approach. Like now, uh, more than ever, there are discussions on how can we integrate uh, the land use sector into a single approach to be more consistent and more integral. So what, what, how can we deal with LULUCF and RED and how is these two can be integrated in a, in a land use um, and, uh, based approach. So these questions are becoming more and more relevant. And finally, we have to keep working in ways uh, and to try to be creative on how can we work to scale up finance for RED in all phases, but in particular for the long term. So countries that are uh, starting um, to, to make changes to achieve RED actually have the certainty that there will be support in the long term and that all the other changes and, um, and policies uh, restructuration that they are doing actually are going to be sustainable in the long run. Um, finally, as some of our colleagues from, from the Red Board have explained, uh, I believe that we have finished building the Red House. So it's, it's there, it's out there, it's existing, so now we just have to equip it and, uh, with all the necessary features and, and keep working. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. So we are now ready for your questions. Indeed, so thank you for those presentations. Those were great, and we're now open for questions. So as I said at the beginning, you can just click on the question section of your toolbar, and you can submit questions that way. And to get us started, we had a couple of questions that came in during the presentation, and the first one I think probably goes to Jono, but the question is, who has the final word on the reference levels? Which is a great question to get us started. Could you, um, you, you Flipped out just for a second. Could you repeat that again, Bree? Sure. The question is, who has the final word on the reference levels? Well, great, <clears throat> great question. I mean, uh, to answer that, I guess pretty quickly, the 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 party will submit its reference level, and as as we've said, no no party has done that yet. So that's um. So ultimately, it's going to be the party that decides, or the country that decides what to put in there. But then. Um, it's going to go through this assessment process, and so the final word is really going to be, um, it, it, if you sort of synthesize the discuss the decision in Warsaw, it's a negotiated conversation between the party and some technical experts who will issue a report. And you might have remembered that I said, when those technical assessors issue that report, we they will be expressing it in uh, tons of CO2 equivalent per year. So that's going to be a really important signal. Party that's been assessed can also put in information. So they may say, you know what, we we don't agree. We think our reference level should have been lower or higher. So there's um, the final word is going to be um, a report about the reference level that's been assessed um, and uh, submitted to the um, Red Web platform. Um, and that's going to be both the assessors and the parties will have a say. Thank you. And, and this is a follow-up question to that, I believe, and it's from the same person. The question is, to what extent are those decisions binding, or what is the risk they won't be abided by? Um, I think I understand the question, but um, I guess I'll answer that in two really quick ways. The first is, um, obviously, Everything about RED is voluntary, so no, no country has to submit a reference level or do anything for that matter. I just want to point that out. But um, as with all COP decisions, um, parties can agree to reverse themselves. In any, in any legislature or Congress, you can always change the laws before you. But, but at, at this point, I think it's, it's a pretty firm, um, it's a pretty healthy, robust framework that says, OK, once you submit against this criteria for your reference level, um, then it's going to go through this very detailed process. Of course, the, the stuff that's going to change that we know is how emission reductions get paid for. I mean, that's, that's where things really fall apart. And I, it, was, it was sad to see, from, from my personal opinion, that um, you know, it's going to be four years before they really bring back the, the, um, the issue of whether there should be a red mechanism. So that, that's... Um, a long-winded answer, but uh, th these are pretty binding decisions as long as the as long as the progress continues towards an overarching agreement fairly soon. Great, and thank you. Can I can I add something, Green? I mean, just please, to, yes. Just to complement uh, what John is saying or, or saying in another words, I mean, it, red is voluntarily, but once once you go and decide to go into red, um, 
you have to go through all the methodological guidance in order to access uh, finance. And if your aim is at the end to, to access resource-based finance, you have to go through all the process. Otherwise, no, nor the UCF or any donor will, will pay for that. So in that sense, it's pretty much binding because otherwise you, you will go through a process that is imperfect and then at the end you won't, you won't get what you, what you want. That's for, from, the, like, from um, uh, the red plus country perspective. And from the donor perspective, unfortunately, there's nothing that ensures that the money is going to be there. Not even if a red country goes through all this process and, and makes, uh, goes through all these requirements perfectly well, um, unfortunately, so far as of today, we don't have uh, any guarantee that the money is going to be there to pay for results for those results produced. So that is, uh, I guess, the, the the key issue here, and why we have to keep pushing and working to to scale up finance and to to guarantee that the money is going to be there at the end and the support. Yes. Thank you. And so the next question, I'm uh, I. This is, again, probably for Jono. The question is, could you say a little more on the pending issues in Substa related to non-carbon benefits? Um, you know, I, I'm probably not the best to handle that. I wonder if um, Josefina or Hima or Mina can do that, please. Sure, I can, I can do that, uh, Jono. Thanks. Um, so there were two, two places where the non-carbon benefits discussion was going to be taking place. One was in the COPPOR program from the point of view of the incentives side and in SOPSTA uh, regarding the methodological issues on non-carbon benefits. So there was an agreement um, uh, from parties that they, they decided that in Warsaw they were not going to dedicate time for non-carbon benefits on the, or the non-market-based approaches so they could finalize and focus on finalizing the, the design elements of RED. Um, but now there's a call for submissions, probably uh, I believe it's March. Uh, on views on this, on this issue of, of uh, non-carbon benefits and, and non-market-based approaches. And in June, the discussions are expected to, to restart. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see uh, how parties uh, approach the issue because uh, there's no definition of non-carbon benefits. So we can be discussing about any benefit that is non-carbon from the social perspective, from the more like biodiversity perspective, water perspective, there are many, many considerations to take um, into account. So we don't really know. We will have to wait and see the, the submissions and see what parties are putting in the table for discussion in June. But this is going to be a, an interesting topic. Uh, so far in the in-session workshops that the parties had during the year, everybody has recognized that non-carbon benefits are important and that red should be beyond carbon. It's just a matter of how to uh, internalize this importance and this relevance into, into the web mechanism. I hope this is useful. Thank you. And we had a request to go back to the what's next slide. So everyone can now see that's up on the screen. And hopefully you'll have a little more time to read that as we do some more questions. So the next question is, if you look at the outcomes, what would be the main implications for private sector voluntary project developers that currently work on VCS slash CCBS projects, such as WWF in Indonesia or South Pole Carbon in Zimbabwe, et cetera? So then, um, uh, anyone want to take a crack at that one? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can do it, and then probably if Kermina and Jono want to jump in, please. Uh, so I guess uh, for me, the, having the rules clear creates certainty uh, about what is red, actually. I mean, red is not anymore like a fuzzy uh, thing that is out there. It's actually something that became real with the, with the methodological package approved. So the private sector now uh, knows clearly what are the rules. And they should try to um, take advantage of this certainty and apply the guidance uh, at, at that level. But so far, the voluntary uh, market can, can develop the project in whatever way they want, right? So it's, it's more flexible. But if you have this set uh, of rules that are clear, why not applying and having the certainty that, uh, that everything, there are no surprises and uh, you know what to expect. So um, it's not mandatory. I mean, project developers can choose uh, to apply the guidance or not, but at least it would be a nice way to hom homogenize uh, actions in the field. Um, however, we have to uh, also recognize that project developers work at the project level, and what we're trying to achieve now with RED is, uh, is actually subnational and national actions. 
that really have a meaningful scale uh, to impact the emissions reductions in, 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 the, in the way we want to actually contribute to the fight against climate change. Um, I don't know if Hermina or John have other uh, insights on that. I'll just add one um, brief thing there. I mean, I think it's a, it's a really important question how the private sector is going to respond to this set of decisions. Um, and, you know, the projects are, it's, it's, it's incumbent on the projects that they need to talk to their governments about how to couch this as a subnational, as, as subnational efforts or, or contributing to national efforts. There's nothing in any of the decisions that defines what is subnational. Um, it's always been assumed that it's bigger than a project, but there's actually nothing in the, in the UN language that does that. Um, so that's, that's always been the case, that, con that project developers really need to be in a very close conversation with countries they're working in. The other thing I guess that I would add in, um, is on the work program on results-based finance, um, there were two interesting um, sentences. Um, one, which was seven, 17, um, basically could um, and again, this doesn't suggest that a project would be given early action, but it's it's some language that sort of says, um, I think it says information included on the information hub um, may be developed, may be relevant or to the same reflected on any other future system may be, developed, may be developed under the convention. It's very fuzzy, but it is potentially an early action language. So that's the only other thing. Great, thank you. So then the next question we have uh, is, it's it's rather long, so I'm going to read it, and then I'm also going to, if Neil, who asked the question, wants to follow up, I will unmute Neil. So here we go with the question. So paragraph 5 and 6 of the decision on results-based finance encourages the integration of methodological guidance between results-based finance under the UNFCCC and other mechanisms. It requests entities providing results-based finance through these other entities to apply methodological guidance consistent with the UNFCCC. Is the reverse also true in that red countries already receiving results-based financing through other mechanisms, like the Japanese joint crediting mechanism, will not have to undergo additional MRV processes under the UNFCCC? Um, what happens if not? And again, that is a long question, so let me find Neil and uh, and see if Neil wants to follow up with anything. Let me find you. I will. Uh, well, Neil. You find Neil, like, I may... Neil is, yeah, Neil is unmuted, but Neil, do, do you want to follow up on that or did I convey it properly? Um, Neil, you're unmuted. If, if um, any of... Um, my colleagues at WWF want to or feel they can tackle it without additional clarification, then go ahead. Otherwise, I, uh, otherwise I can help out. Okay. I'll, I'll try to answer, Neil, and please let me know if, uh, if I am understanding your question correctly. So, yeah, I, I see paragraph 5 and 6. Um, sorry, can you mute sorry. yourself because I, I'm hearing my... I'm going to mute, Neil. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, if I understand correctly, the question uh, is, well, since paragraph 5 and 6 encourage other entities uh, financing activities, uh, red activities, uh, they, they are encouraged to apply the guidance, right? So, I don't think, I mean, I think this is from now on. Um, we haven't talked about uh, early crediting or crediting for early action. Uh, so, whatever is happening now may not be part of the actual uh, red mechanism under the convention. We haven't had that discussion and this is something that um, is going to be useful to, to have in the radar. The decision also it does make uh, some, some reference to the consistency of the results with any future mechanism. So that kind of like uh, implies that uh, there should be um, consistent, if, if we go into a different regime or, or move forward in, in a post-2020 agreement, there should be consistency between now and then. However, if I understand correctly, your question is whatever is already in place and has their own system, uh, it's exempt to, uh, to apply the, the guidance. And I, I don't think so. I mean, I think whatever it comes under the rules of the convention should, should follow all the rules of the convention. All other deals that are out there, bilateral deals, the multilateral uh, organizations paying or results-based actions, like for example, the, the carbon fund will start paying soon. 
um, they have their own guidance. Uh, this is outside the convention, so it's not. It doesn't belong to to, to the UNFCCC. So um, I guess uh, everything that is outside the UNFCCC, it's encouraged to apply the methodologies, uh, the methodological guidance, but it's not mandatory, and they can keep doing their things as they, they are doing. Uh, however, for the joint uh, crediting mechanism in Japan, I believe because they are starting, it would be very useful to look at the methodological guidance and adopt it, and then move forward with these rules so, so they don't have to create their own rules, uh, unless they, they don't like it and they want to create some, some parallel and additional process. But this is precisely what the, the decision is trying to avoid, to have different set of rules and just to apply ones. So, in my mind, everything that is uh, that is going to be new under the convention should apply the guidance. Whatever is out there can, can be adjusted to adopt this guidance, but it's, it's not mandatory. The language is very soft. It, it only says encourage, encourages other entities working in, in that uh, uh, in resource-based finance to, to apply the methodology. Also, it, there is no requirement. It's just encouragement. Uh, is, that, is that useful, Neil? I think that that helps a great deal. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Okay, Neil, I'm going to mute you again here while we move on to our next question. So the next question is another one on reference levels, and this one asks, has it been decided yet that historical deforestation adjusted for country circumstances is the approach that is going to be used to estimate the reference levels, or um, other approaches such as stock flow, are those possible as well? I can start with that. Um, hi, Neil. First of all, it's great to hear your voice again um, before we go on to the next question. Um, yeah, the, the short answer is yes. Um, the previous decisions on reference level basically say that they should be based on historical data um, and that countries can adjust those um, based on their national circumstances. So um, as I'm sure the person asking the question knows, there's a lot of concern about how those adjustments get made in both directions, right? There's concerns from environmentalists that uh, countries are going to adjust their reference levels to get fake emission reductions, and there's concerns from, from countries with um, low deforestation rates, but probably pretty big threats coming down the road that they're not going to get enough payments. So right now, the, the way it stands is countries need to submit their historical data. They need to be transparent about what adjustments they make. Um, they have to defend those rationales based on the decisions taken in Durban. Um, and then it's going to go through an assessment process and have a public report. So um, as I said, it's sort of at this point now sort of a negotiation between assessors and the parties um, against that language. And that language says start with historical, but then if you want to, you can adjust. Great. Thank you. So we have two more questions, and then, and then I think we're, we're getting to the end of our time. So. Well, I'll ask this one, and then the next one will be our last question. But this one asks, last year's COP had a number of statements on gender in Red Plus. Has there been anything in the new decisions furthering participation, equity, and empowerment of women within Red? Um, yes, I can, uh, I can answer that. Uh, there was no uh, reiteration of uh, anything in particular or anything, any language specifically uh, addressing gender issues. Um, I believe there is a recall of decisions made in the past that, uh, that address this issue, in um, particular uh, Cancun, the Cancun decision, it's, it's been recalled in, in several of the decisions um, that parties adopted in this COP, but uh, no, no statements um, particularly on gender. I can tell you that there were some discussions in the subsidized BI process at some point when they were talking about coordination and what sort of uh, functions um, and institutional arrangements there should be in place for coordination. There was a lot of, uh, not a lot, but there was some discussion about gender issues and if, if uh, we could put something in the decision. However, if you, if you go over the decision, there is barely anything specific about any topic. There is more like general and about process. So at the end, no, no specific language was, was introduced. Great, thank you. So this will be our final question. And again, as I said at the beginning, if there are other questions that we don't have time to answer, we can certainly 
post the answers to those on redcommunity.org. And again, you'll get the link in the follow-up email on where you can find that, and, and we'll post those there. So the, the final question is, again, from Neil. So it's a longer one. I'll read it. And then, uh, Neil, if, if we need some clarification, again, I'll unmute you. So the question is, do you envision envisage that red nations wishing to receive results-based payments and developed parties keen to provide results-based financing might agree on this relationship bilaterally outside the UNFCCC and then simply have the RELs slash MRV implemented through the UNFCCC, i.e., will providers of finance and red nations be able to choose, in quotes, each other and set specific levels of payment between themselves, or will the UNFCCC automatically link finance providers with red nations supplying emissions reductions? Link to that, so... <laughs> Furthermore, will all RBF be on equal levels, or do you envision, envision providers of finance choosing to pay more for emissions reductions they believe to be more accurate or credible? So again, that's that's a long one. Um, does anyone want to take a stab at it, or um, I can Neil, you're unmuted if you if you need to add further detail. I can try to answer. I mean, I go ahead, Neil. No, no, I go ahead yourself. <laughs> okay, so I guess uh, there are two parts of the question. The first one, I believe that absolutely there are going to be, so far the, the decisions made keep the door open and recognize the key role of the Green Climate Fund, but not the unique role or the exclusive role in channeling uh, results-based finance. And more and more I've been hearing parties, developed parties, saying that uh, the multilateral and bilateral agreements will be still in place in, in phase three. So that means that you'll have a mix of uh, different formulas that will make sense for donors and red countries. Uh, the idea would be that most of the of the funds will cha will be channeled through the Green Climate Fund, so you guarantee consistency and fairness and uh, in the distribution of, of resources. But that doesn't imply that you can regulate or or, or provide or prevent uh, sorry prevent other countries to seek um, bilateral or multilateral agreements. Um, so in my in my mind, this is going to be a, a world in which we have a mix of different formulas that make sense in different levels. Um, so that's one part of the question. The second part was uh, more, if I understand it correctly, about the pricing and about the what is the amount of the payment. Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, I have no idea what is going to happen. My expectation would be that we have one single unit for the payments uh, to, to create certainty uh, in a future regime where market and non-market based approaches coexist. Um, so under the convention I would say that uh, we would expect to have a standard standard uh, payments, uh, but outside the convention nothing will, will prevent that country set their own premiums if they want to pay more for a proposal that has certain characteristics that are important for, for the donor. So it's very uncertain. Unfortunately, I, can, I cannot give you a more precise answer just because we haven't, we're not there yet. Uh, even in Warsaw, the discussions on the new market mechanism were completely stalled and nothing happened because there were like very deep disagreements on how to uh, approach this issue. Um, and the other side, you have donor countries uh, saying that uh, these commitments that were made before in Copenhagen and before, uh, they expect that 60% of this, this uh, amount that was committed would come from the private sector, not from public sources, right? So then this even makes things more complicated because then you cannot dictate what the private sector is going to be doing. You can try to help to standardize, but you cannot really say or tell them what, what to do. So it's going to be... That part of the question is, is a little bit hard to answer, but uh, in terms of the of the first part of the question, I, I believe you will have a, a very diverse world in which bilateral, multilateral agreements and the, and the GCF will co coexist. Great, thank you. So we're coming to the end of our time here, so I'm just going to jump through to the last few slides we have here that just highlight a few of our additional red resources if you're looking for some more information from the negotiations or an archive of this learning session or archive of past learning sessions along with some sign up uh, lists that you can join to, to make sure you're keeping in the loop with our red work. And, uh, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. You can use this email address here. 
and, um, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. As I said, the, the recording of this session will be up on Red Community, and uh, you can check there in a few days, and you'll be able to access it, or you can also go to YouTube. And so with that, I will bring us to a close. Thanks again for joining us today, and thanks to our presenters for this great session, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.